Hello from the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, Austria. At our department, much of our research focuses on uh, discriminatory mechanisms in different fields of society and our culture, for instance, in technoscience, as well as in information and uh, communication technology. For this year's Oz Electronica Festival, we are very excited to announce our project, How to Become a High-Tech Anti-Discrimination Activist Collective, which is supported by the Linz Institute of Technology. For this project, we have invited international and national experts to engage with us in a discussion on how digital media and new technologies reinforce and shape our perceptions of race and gender, also in ways which are unwanted sometimes. For instance, algorithms have often been believed to function more objectively than humans. However, it has become increasingly clear that this is not the case. Algorithms are just as biased as the institutions and developers who produce them. This means that racism and sexism is inscribed in much of the technology that we use. Our project addresses this issue and it asks how discrimination in the design and functioning of technology can be overcome. We are delighted to have two keynotes, one by Lisa Nakamura and one by Safiya Noble. Lisa Nakamura is a professor for American culture and digital studies at the University of Michigan and Arbor. She is truly one of the leading scholars in examining um, race in digital media. And in her talk, she will um, reflect on a very recent phenom phenomenon um, and experiences of ethnic minorities. And her talk is entitled Estranging Digital Racial Terrorism After COVID. Thank you for coming to my talk or listening and watching the video of my talk, Estranging Digital Racial Terrorism After COVID. My name is Lisa Nakamura and I teach at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, where I serve as the inaugural director of the Digital Studies Institute. The Institute, which was established on January 1, 2019, provides space for scholars working on the intersections of data, power, and inequality. I am really sorry we're not all together. And before I begin um, speaking to you from a bedroom in my house in Ann Arbor, I would like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations made the single largest land donation to the University of Michigan, offered ceremonially as a gift in the text of the treaty at the foot of the rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and affirmed. This is a crucial moment for us as digital scholars, makers, thinkers, creators, creators, people, to directly address racial inequality and unequal access to life, as well as global xenophobia, nationalism, and tech's role within it. COVID has made this worse. In March 2020, Fernand de Varenne, the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, warned that physical attacks and hate speech against racial minorities, especially Asians, Roma, and Latinx people, were escalating as right-wing groups blamed them for the Chinese virus. So, this is not the time to distract ourselves with the old critical debates about the nature of the digital versus the real. Yet at the same time, I'm not saying we shouldn't be talking about theory. Instead, we need to talk about theory more than we ever have. We need to talk about theories of political purchase and what digital media um, thinking gets us when we examine platforms like Instagram and TikTok and how they're fashioning new kinds of racial and gender affects in the face of overt racism. How can we use our tools and our theories to recognize the material, theoretical, and political work that women of color perform every day by creating videos of their experiences with racism and sexism, and most crucially to me, framing them as alien to the network, as surprising, as odd, as out of place, um, as not 
fundamentally needed or important in the network. The network which licensed this behavior and has amplified it since the early 90s um, and has contributed to our collective tolerance for racism in public. What opportunities for estranging or making defamiliar or odd um, digital racism from our life worlds might surface in our current moment when we look at the practices of women of color. And I'm particularly interested in young women of color using these video mediums like Instagram and TikTok. I believe that the Ars Electronica programmers, who I thank very much for um, this opportunity to speak at this conference, precisely because they see women of color critique, technocritique, as a relevant tool for understanding the violence, disaffection, and despair about racial violence we see on and off the internet. Racism and sexism are purposely designed into digital networks as fundamentally ordinary experiences that are nonetheless consistently referred to as exceptional. This is the way that companies can evade um, regulation. They say, well, these things are exceptional. They don't happen all the time. It's just some bad apples um, and it's not worth regulating or it's in or, or there's so much of it, it's impossible to regulate. There's never anything in between. Um, regulation is always skirted. And when I mean um, fundamentally ordinary, the tech industry was based upon the cheap labor, and in some cases free labor, of women of color who created um, chips, components, parts <laughs> that let experimenters and um, engineers innovate without having to worry about the cost or the supply of parts that they had. Um, I've heard some engineers from that period talk about how it's so great that they didn't have unions and still don't have unions in the industry because they never could have innovated if they had to think about scarcity. Instead, it was just do whatever you like, be free and open and think about whatever you want. Don't think about where it's coming from. Um, so the digital industries maintain this kind of business as usual. It's um, racist from the, and sexist from the production side, the invisible side to the side that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, platforming these formations that have enabled everyday violence for users of color while also solidifying the monopoly. So, you know, the stocks that are okay, I mean, stocks are not the economy, but you know, the parts of the economy that are doing well are things like Zoom, which is, you know, for a while was worth more than GM, um, General Motors, one of the biggest auto companies in the US. There's been this incredible blossoming and consolidation of companies like Amazon, which was making, you know, huge amounts of money a minute, you know, or even an hour after COVID while well, everybody was, you know, bereft of other choices. The two biggest issues of the 21st century are the concurrent and interrelated rise of the tech monopolies and fascism and white nationalism. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about the aesthetic and political possibilities of one particular post-COVID racial formation that directly addresses both, I would say, and those are cancel videos. So when I was writing this paper, I thought I should call it um, cancel culture or something about cancel culture, um, but I didn't want to because that's, I'm not here to say whether cancel culture is good or bad. What I really want to talk about is the um, production and framing practices that people are employing when they capture racism in the wild and choose to circulate it online and the ways in which they use this as not a technique, but as a way of life. It's a way of living. And I'll, I'll explain that a little more. These young women of color have created a digital archive of, of um, incidents on TikTok and Instagram, but other places too, Tumblr. Um, that document how they experience the rise of um, monopolies, narrowing of economic possibilities, you know, extreme misogyny and sexism and racism online and in their um, public lives, and also importantly, their reactions to it. And they are able to frame it the way the they would like the world to see it. Though the term cancel culture was new to a lot of people this summer, it's not new. It dates back to at least 2014 when the Tumblr blog Racist Getting Fired got noticed by the press. And it's less a culture than it is a crux or a meeting or even a fighting place for generationally incommensurate or incompatible beliefs about digital video and social media. The term make her famous or make him famous 
which surfaced on Tumblr a long time ago, is now everywhere. It's a catchphrase that marks a cancel video as a cancel video. Um, it's an open request to the viewer to share this document, to share the evidence of this behavior in order to create a material consequence for the person who did it. Where, whereas in the past, people experience racism, sexism all the time, um, often they had to suffer these things alone and in silence. Cancel videos um, make it possible to share the experience and most importantly, to frame the reaction um, and to defang it by defamiliarizing the activity. So I'm gonna talk about that a little more. So um, the idea of making him or her famous, as I said, that was on Tumblr for quite a while, but it wasn't really a thing for people until March 25th, 2020, when Christian Cooper's sister uploaded a video of a white woman, Amy Cooper, no relation, calling the police on her brother, who was there watching birds in Central Park, um, captured the video of her lying that he was attacking her. It wasn't until then that it actually came to pass that a racist was, quote, made famous um, this way. And everyone seemed to want to know what cult cancel culture was and to have a strong position on it. Um, this Harper's letter, which you might have heard about, is basically the old guard of public intellectuals, writers, culture workers, or knowledge workers objecting to cancel culture, saying that it's unfair to them that they should have to be accountable for transphobic or other racist, sexist um, opinions they put out there, that they should not, people shouldn't talk about them and people shouldn't have an opinion about it. But I think that's just so unfamiliar to people who are younger. So for example, on May 25th, a 17 year old girl, Darnella Frazier, saw a man being brutalized on a Minneapolis street by several police officers. She stopped, as did a bunch of other people, and took out her phone and turned it on. Darnella said, it seemed like it was like a natural instinct, honestly, to start recording, quote, the world needed to see what I was seeing Stuff like this happens in silence too many times. She posted it on Facebook on May 26th, where it was viewed millions of times and picked up by news outlets. You might have seen it. The man's name was George Floyd. As Darnella Frazier said, video recording racial violence is a natural instinct for her. And these videos did what they were meant to do. They made Derek Chauvin, the policeman who killed Floyd, and Amy Cooper famous and it cost them their jobs. Like many young people of color of her generation, as she says, it never occurred to her not to capture it and to share it, and other people were capturing it as well. Um, as one of many of the generation of people who were denied the jobs, security, and even environmental security of a not too rapidly warming planet that older white people in the US see as their birthright, they've already had those things, and they refuse to give them up. Um, they are not interested in preserving them for anybody else. She didn't have anything to gain by keeping the secret of racism a secret. I'm interested in the material, theoretical, and political frame that young women of color put around cancel videos. I'm interested in cancel, canceling and, um, and so on. But I think it's really important to look at the person no one's looking at which is the person who's making the video. Frazier's video of George Floyd was an absolutely necessary act, not just to her, and in the she one, as she says, but to the Black Lives Matter movement. Young women use Instagram and TikTok to record their own emotional reactions to violent racism in order to thrust those events into a different frame of reference. You do get to control what's in your phone, even if you can't control anything else around you. Um, and we can understand cancel videos as strategic technopolitical interventions into public racism. Today I'm going to discuss two specific ones, one by Jordan Chan and the other by Sarah Pashpandi. Um, one's a Instagram and one's a TikTok. Um, um, as examples of how we might imagine alternatives to the consumable spectacularization of black and person of color suffering which is so often leveraged to provide pleasurable emotions of racial empathy to white liberal viewers who really enjoy feeling the right feelings, 
even if they're wrong feelings or bad feelings of outrage, compassion, etc. Sadia Hartman and Courtney Baker, in their work, have done some um, outstanding theorizing about how it is that feeling good, feeling bad, can feel good, right? That even going back to the period where there was chattel slavery in the U.S., um, the idea of seeing black suffering was often about the moment for white empathy and white liberation um, from the suffering, right? Seeing the suffering and feeling badly and then feeling you had done something. Um, this is what uh, Lauren Berlant calls in her book on compassion, um, not the most useful emotion. Yet nonetheless, we see compassion as the most important emotion. And, and I'm gonna talk about how these videos and the way they're framed absolutely deny that as a possibility and instead go really to the heart of what we're calling systemic racism by asking for a systemic material redress, right? Not symbolic repair. So taking um, the picture of a black woman off of the pancake syrup bottle and Jemima, um, you might have noticed how there was this big scramble to remove racist iconography, especially anti-black iconography from products and even to remove media like Gone with the Wind from streaming services. This was never what anybody wanted. It really mistakes symbolic repair for material and economic repair. So let me build the bridge a little bit between these videos um, and how they exemplify a form of economic or material repair. And I, as I think really head off this impulse to feel sympathy and to feel good about your sympathy. The videos demand more than awareness. Again, an over, overvalued term. Um, the thinking that racism is really about ignorance that it's simply a matter of giving people more information. And sometimes the word exposure is even used, that people have not been exposed to education. Um, absolutely not true. I think um, what we see from the far right, in fact, is a deep investment in educational institutions, <laughs> um, often some of the most prestigious ones that we have. Uh, so um, again, that's a commodity, you know, a great education. Um, at a university that many young people are denied because it's incredibly expensive and they can't afford it. So how are young women using Instagram and TikTok to index and to record the, these reactions to racism and to reframe them? Um, uh, instead of centering the suffering racialized body, which is what other kinds of appeal media have done. So, um, you know, lots of examples, Rodney King, is, a, is one that strings immediately to mind, um, that is shocking, that shows um, trauma, that asks a witness to be there for the abjection. It focuses instead upon reparation through viral circulation and uses defamiliarizing laughter from the person making the video and receiving the racism as a form of reparation. When creating videos that witness public racism, these document not only the existence of the event, location, even the time, because um, phones do that, but also their reaction. I think that's really key. Often surprise, disengagement, and disaffection, um, which completes the circuit of witnessing and estranges racism as fundamentally alien. I'm gonna show what that looks like. The term to weaponize means to unfairly leverage an otherwise innocuous or even kind of benign or nice object to make it cause harm. These cancel videos weaponize the kind of bored or, you know, not really bored, but just over it. You know, what the heck, what are you doing? Um, reaction uh, to racism. The strategy estranges it and exposes it as a performance, um, a performance of power that can't be disavowed and made to disappear with an apology. Instead, the video goes straight into um, the server, right? Um, the apology happens later. And often the apology is not an apology. The apology is, I'm sorry, that's not who I am. Those aren't my values, um, which is exactly the opposite of what happened, right? To say that I am not that thing that you saw, but that was me. Um, is to say that racism is a quality that I decide 
whether it exists. It's an internal state. And since you can't see into my internal state, you don't really know if it's there. Um, and that's not a structural understanding of racism at all, or a systemic understanding. So I'm arguing that um, when we see these videos, they're really skirting that, right? They're going right to the material redress and ignoring the apology. I don't think the apology is the point for them. On July 4th, Independence Day in the US, Jordan Eli Chan and her family were at the Bernardus Lodge and Spa's Lucia restaurant in Carmel Valley. Beautiful. Everyone's sitting outdoors. They were celebrating her aunt's birthday. Um, it was evening, beautiful evening. Um, a white man with a British accent who was eating alone right across from them um, started swearing at them. Then he flipped them off and then he told them um, to go home, you Asian pieces of shit. Jordan took out her phone and posted this on Instagram with the title, shared this post, and with a trigger warning for racism, abuse. And it was. The video was viewed over a million times. It made it into the news, the local news, KPIX, on July 11th reported that um, Lofthouse had resigned from his position as CEO of Solid8, which is a Silicon Valley tech startup, um, which does cloud computing. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit and how that relates to this. And they described the video as an example of, quote, how Asian, anti-Asian American discrimination is on the rise. So Lofthouse's apology, which he posted after resigning, said, my behavior in this video is appalling. This was clearly a moment where I lost control and made incredibly hurtful and divisive comments. Again, disavowing responsibility by saying it wasn't his choice, he lost control. Um, so there's a lot of things to say about this video. I think it went viral, partly because it shows us the kind of person who we don't associate with white nationalism. He's not wearing any swastikas or fascist regalia. He's by himself. He's nicely dressed. He's sitting on a patio. Um, but this is exactly the kind of capillary racism which characterizes Silicon Valley, where platforms that support this hate speech and both systemic and performative racism are produced. Um, his company, Solid8, it's a um, privately held startup that specializes in enterprise-facing cloud computing, which is to say it's the place where Jordan's video went possibly, right, like AWS. It's a place where um, content goes and is then served out to other places. Um, a really eloquent example of how Silicon Valley, um, the monopoly, but also the white racial, white, white male racial monopoly, monopoly um, is always at the heart of what's going on here. And really the industry is thriving after COVID. It's doing better than it ever has. Um, it's gaining value consolidating its monopolies, and it's still one of the widest and most male industries there are. And so another moment for purchase, I believe, where on the one hand, we're, I think, incredibly aware that this is where the problems are coming from, at least some of them, and it needs to change. So let me talk about how these women are, are trying to change it or what they're doing um, is a reaction that, that again, come, kind of puts the lie to a lot of the language around empathy, ignorance, um, and compassion being the answer. Racist cancel videos are the viral video genre par excellence of post-COVID America. People are watching a lot of these and Americans really don't agree on them. Um, over the summer, I got a lot of questions from the press about cancel culture, what is it? And do I think it's good or bad? And, and really, there's no answer to that. Um, you can't answer that question because Cancel culture emerges um, from really incompatible and incommensurate worldviews and assumptions um, and experiences of racism, as well as really incompatible and at odds ideas and beliefs about when it's okay to record something and to share it. So it's because there are many older people who instinctually resist being recorded. You know, they, they think it's illegal, first of all, often, um, which it is often not. And um, it's because they're so, in, so strongly against being recorded, they'll often try to grab the phone during a Karen video. Um, they're providing the very activity um, which the people who instinctually record them record. <laughs> so Karen videos exist at this nexus and they're really compelling because they document this clash of cultures, right? The new post-COVID racial formation, 
which is disaffection and surprise. And I've seen many of these where you hear some racist, horrible racist thing by somebody, and then the person making the video will be like, what? You know, if someone says the N-word, they're like, they're just like, what? Like, very surprised. Um, you don't hear fear often, um, though I don't believe people are afraid. I think you hear disbelief. So you can hear it in Chan's voice when Lofthouse says, go home, you Asian fuck. She says, oh my God, in a disbelieving way, which is the same thing you would say if you saw something really strange in your food or just something horribly out of place and kind of gross, right? Something that is both beneath your notice and really, you know, kind of disgusting. Um, so I'm not really interested in Lofthouse or his motivations. I see him mainly as a very typical kind of Silicon Valley person. He spent his whole career working with Asian people because that's what Silicon Valley is. It's all a lot of Asian workers. Everything is physically made off and in Asia. And you, many Asian people, they're the only racial group which isn't underrepresented in the industry, though they're underrepresented in management. Um, I think too many people were looking at him as it was. Um, instead, I'm interested in, on, in the invisible actor in these videos, which is the person making the video, their reaction, and how they frame their reaction. When interviewed by KPIX News, Jordan Chan said, quote, I've dealt with racism before, but never on that scale, never on the level where somebody completely unprovoked felt obligated to voice their hatred for absolutely no reason. She experienced this kind of racism as new, and she wanted to capture it. It was noteworthy, and that's why she goaded him or invited him to say that again. So he had been doing it for a while before she took out her phone. He knew that he was being recorded by her. Um, her disbelieving reaction arises from a genuine feeling of surprise and a determination to document the moment, to show that it happened, um, to to kind of give voice to the escalation. As she said, this had never happened to me before. I'm never on that scale. Um, her uh, surprise is more visible than the feelings he meant her to have, which were fear and anger. He didn't mean her to laugh at him. He meant her to be afraid. Posting the video and requesting wide circulation is a systemic reaction to a systemic problem. The phrase systemic racism, in fact, used to be just an academic term, but I've seen it quite a lot in the news um, and in movement language. And it's because it describes something that's invisible, something that's intractable, something that's structural, and something that's material, right? It describes the arrangements and institutions, the causes and conditions that make racism perennial. So we can change the pancake bottle forever, right? That's not gonna get at the question of systemic racism. Instead, getting racists fired may do that. When young people make videos to document what they experience, right, what their racism is in their everyday life, they're doing more than canceling a harasser. They don't, I don't know that they necessarily, that's not the instinct, right? The instinct is to model a new tactic of defamiliarization by capturing not just the incident, but their own responses. So the video must be made, of course you would make it, um, and of course, your reaction is part of the video. Uh, Chris Cooper, the producer of the viral Amy Cooper video in Central Park, um, was praised by everyone, first of all, for not wanting Amy Cooper to lose her job. He didn't think that was fair. Um, he didn't ask for that. It was what people demanded as a result of watching on their own and making their own conclusions. Um, he was praised for being calm and dignified. And people of color, especially of his generation, have had a lot of practice being calm and dignified in the face of racism because the alternative is sometimes death. The Lofthouse video is really different because instead of being calm and dignified, it records hilarity. It records a kind of carnivalesque, you know, defamiliarization of like, what? What is wrong with you? And that's even what someone says in the back, like, what's wrong with you? This is not to say the incident wasn't traumatizing and Chan, you know, as I just said, she found that disturbing and that's what she, well, that's why she put a trigger warning on it. Um, but when you watch it, her response really estranges the pain by framing it with surprise as him being weird and antiquated and really bizarre. And what's more, it indexes what he's doing as part of a boomer generation 
that condemns cancel culture as unfair while at the same time providing the material that make these videos possible. Terms like boomer and Karen, and I've heard Karen being, you know, made into a male named Kevin, um, are not even about how old you are anymore. Um, these are viral media because what they're doing is staging an archetypal spectacle where two people fundamentally don't understand each other. Um, well, the person who is the Karen or the Kevin might be young or old. In any case, they're just out of time. They're out of step. They are out of place. <laughs> and often they tell people, go home, go to your own country, you're in the wrong place. Um, but the way the videos frame them is that they're out of place. They don't understand that the biggest global social movement of the 21st century is Black Lives Matter <laughs> and that systemic racism is under the microscope right now. Um, cancel videos can't capture systemic racism because again, it's historical, institutional, invisible, um, therefore very intractable. What they can do, however, is to preserve a resurgent nationalist racist project and make fun of it to blow it off as retrograde, as old fashioned, just weird. So these videos map a relation between the spectator, the act, and the actor, the platform and the event that stage an ideological clash over racial violence that reaches right through the screen. People are, again, compulsively watching cancel videos while we're all stuck at home. Um, this clash maps onto the internet's history of failed content moderation. We have Karens because we never regulated speech, right? Um, the industry's absolute refusal to control has resulted in their absolute control of the internet. As post-colonial theorist Ambella Vanner Sivanandan said, we are here because you were there. The digital amplification of racist and sexist speech in digital space, the permission and even the encouragement to do this has habituated a generation of men to provide the content for cancel videos. Just like websites like Tumblr's The 2014 Getting Racist Fired has been nurturing and mobilizing a generation of young women and people of color to campaign employers to fire them. Cancel culture is not a culture. Again, it's a natural instinct to young women of color who, like Fraser Chan and Pashpandi, make recordings because these are their lives and because seeing is still believing. These videos stage pithy conversations about colonialism, sovereignty, and the right to space, especially on TikTok. It's really amazing. In Pashpandi's TikTok, she and her friend are confronted by a white woman who tells them to stop picking berries in the park. So one of them has torn a little branch of berries off of a bush, and um, she starts getting angry at them for destroying the bushes. And when they say it's just a small piece of the bush, uh, she gets angry. Um, they tell her, why are you attacking two young girls in the park? And she loses her mind and says, go back to where you came from. Her spontaneous outburst is, in other words, the same as Michael Lofthouse's, go back to where you came from. And it's the central pillar of the white nationalist agenda. Again, you need to leave. However, in this TikTok, these girls really turn around, you need to leave on her. And video editing is really why the platform is so valuable, what makes the video so interesting. You can make a great video with their tool and as much time as it takes to you know, get a drink of water. Um, and what this TikTok does is to exploit the brevity of the platform to reverse the racist gaze using you know, visual techniques. Um, ending the clip right after the harasser is led to admit at, that as a white US born Canadian, she is more foreign to Canada than these young women of color who are born there does what TikTok does best, it drops the mic. In contrast to most researchers who study race in the digital, Andre Brock, who's the author of Distributed Blackness from Duke University Press 2020, oh sorry, NYU Press, is interested in Twitter as a vector for black joy as well as black pain. In contrast to traditionally virtuous uses, uses of the internet by people of color, such as education, political organizing, which used to be the justification to try to bridge the digital divide. If we had done that a little earlier, we wouldn't be in the situation we are now with COVID, where some people can't take class because they don't have anything to take class with. Um, he doesn't believe that the internet is important just for those reasons. Instead, he's interested in ratchet black Twitter, the ungovernable, funny, weird, anarchic, unproductive, defiantly unproductive 
Twitter, that stands for nothing more than itself and its own right to enjoy life. It's a public evidence of thriving, an affective rebuke to white supremacy. I'm writing a book on Zoom bombing with two doctoral students at Michigan, Hannah Stiverson and Kyle Lindsay, about how Zoom bombing arises from the inability to tolerate black joy. Since COVID, we've seen college graduations, study groups, dissertation defenses, and organizing meetings go online. And when black people put together um, virtual cookouts, like at the University of um, South Carolina, and invite everyone to come, as they have often, as they have always done in their community, um, Zoom bombers will show up and show porn, they'll put up swastikas, they'll use pornography, they'll use blackface imagery. Um, because like Zoom, like the other platforms I was talking about, control by refusing to control. Um, they scaffold the everydayness of racial violence and its interpenetration into intimate daily life of people of color. So a drunken tech CEO's racist attack on a loved aunt's birthday party is a gesture of resentment. It's meant to destroy the enjoyment of people of color in each other's company. The incredulous, non-virtuous, what, say that again? Right, which is not a political argument. It's just like, what? Um, the young people record when they capture moments like this in their lives, asserts the right to public joy in parks, on patios, and neighborhoods that animates both black Twitter and these cancel videos. So who belongs here? Both Zoom bombing and cancel culture videos document racist behavior in public. Now Zoom is the public um, when we make the links open. Um, these visual records of racism gain purchase and come to matter as part of an attention economy um, better attuned to anti-black racism. So again, we're looking at these, I think, in a slightly different way now that we're, um, many of us are more attuned to how pervasive and systemic racism is. Their role in movement building, again, Instagram, TikTok, um, has been downgraded in much the same way that women of color's labor has always been downgraded in regards to the internet. Again, the internet circuits, devices, services, content moderation is all done for cheap or free by women of color. Offshore, in this country, it's been dismissed, it's been discounted. So the work that these racist cancel videos are doing are part of a bigger technopolitical strategy of reparative action that frames it as both an anomaly and as an appeal to public redress. It defamiliarizes what the unregulated internet has made totally familiar. So even though we may flee content sections and not play multiplayer video games, you see hatred every day on the internet. What this does is to laugh at it, to defamiliarize it, and, and to estrange it, right? Um, I see an opening here, a strategy which decenters trauma as the best argument for this cosmetic and apolitical empathy for black people and people of color, and I think the term people like to use is virtue signaling. It's just a gesture, literally. It's not a material redress, and replaces it with a plan, even if the plan is for someone to lose their job. To finish with um, the example from the patio, um, even though he was the founder and CEO of his company, Michael Lofthouse was fired. His racism against these Asian fucks had a material consequence on his life. Thriving youth and person of color joy on TikTok and Instagram videos can model how um, the affect of estrangement in these cancel uh, media can defamiliarize which all that which is all too familiar and that which we can no longer tolerate. Thank you. Our second speaker is Sophia Noble, who is a professor of information studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. She's also co-director of UCLA's uh, Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. And in her talk, she will present insights from her best-selling book, Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. Hi, I'm Safiya Noble. I'm an associate professor at UCLA in the departments of Information Studies, African American Studies, and Gender Studies. And I co-direct the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry with my longtime collaborator, Dr. Sarah Roberts. 
I'm really thrilled to be a part of Ars Electronica, and I can't thank Doris, uh, Professor Doris Weichselbaumer enough for inviting me to participate. Certainly, um, the team at the Johannes Kepler University and the collective working on how to become a high-tech anti-discrimination activist is extraordinary. And uh, I'm thrilled to know about your work and to think about how our work at UCLA is in dialogue with your work. So thank you to all of the faculty, students, uh, the provost and everyone involved from the university and from the leadership of Ars Electronica for including me in your conference. It's such a thrill. And of course, um, it's even more of a delight to be uh, involved in a conference with Professor Lisa Nakamura too, because she was someone I learned so much from when I was a graduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So to um, have this opportunity to um, share and participate in this conference um, with her is also a thrill. So I just wanna say thank you for including me. I'm gonna to talk today about some of my work that I've been working on for a long time. Uh, and even though I've been at this conversation about racist and sexist discrimination in technology, um, it's not an old conversation. There's still so, so much work to do. And so I thought that maybe uh, by talking you through some examples from my book, and sharing with you some of the research that I started a decade ago, uh, indeed, um, might be a place to open up conversations while you're participating in Ars Electronica. And um, of course, uh, the consequences of racist and sexist discrimination in technology platforms is so profound. You know, when I started my dissertation work, which eventually kind of morphed over time into the book, Algorithms of Oppression, it was very difficult to get people to concede that technologies could be designed in racist and sexist ways. In fact, the prevailing logic 10 years ago was that uh, computer code is just math and math cannot discriminate. And these are things that people often argued uh, to me at conferences and when I was sharing my work uh, in the early days. And so it's um, outstanding, quite frankly, to see what happened in, uh, in you know, less than a decade, where now we see headlines from around uh, the, uh, the world. Certainly in the United States, we see these. I see them in Australia. I see them in Europe where um, the, let's say the curtain is being pulled back on the kinds of harms that come from a variety of different kinds of technologies. And one of the things that I've been particularly concerned with in my work are the ways in which race and gender are encoded into platforms, um, especially large technology platforms, but of course a variety of different kinds of technologies. Uh, 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 need to be interrogated and looked at closely. And so I'm going to walk you through some of the work that I've done, but I'll also share with you some ideas of things that I think are coming and why this is such an incredibly important area of research that we need to focus on. And when I, um, and when I say that we need to focus on this, what I mean is that we need to do more than um, uh, think about the new language of things like AI and ethics, which of course are important. Um, no one would argue that people should not be ethical in the way that they approach technology design. But I think there are other words that are more powerful and more potent. And it's one of the reasons why I talk about things like algorithms of oppression, because oppression actually signals to us that we're working at the level of social structure. We're talking about social policy, um, uh, public policy. We're talking about economics and economic systems. We're talking about histories of occupation, um, histories of patriarchy that all live and exist 
powerfully in our contemporary moment. These aren't just systems of the past that we inherit. We certainly inherit them and we have to think about our own moral and ethical relationship to these systems. But when I'm talking about um, thinking through the implications of AI and algorithms, I'm thinking in terms of um, powerful, over-determining systems of, um, uh, of race and racialization, of gender uh, and genderizing that categorize and classify people into what seem to be kind of totalizing categories oftentimes um, that when encoded into systems become very difficult to intervene upon. So those are some of the things that I want to talk about today, really focusing on these dimensions of race and gender with technology, because um, in the contemporary moment, uh, we are hearing a lot of conversation about ethics, but uh, in other words, fairness, accountability, transparency, these are words that often get used now uh, and are, uh, in fact, we're seeing kind of a new cottage industry of uh, universities and um, think tanks and labs that are taking up these concerns about AI and ethics. But what happens, I think oftentimes, is that we defang and depoliticize the really important dimensions of um, power. And those, those dimensions of power often operate at the level of racialization and genderizing and even um, around our sexualities. So uh, certainly I feel thrilled that uh, uh, when I see this uh, particular headline that 2017 was the year we fell out of, loves, out of love with algorithms, I think of um, uh, what, what a small role I might have been able to play in my, with my own work. And I, I feel like so many of us are just like um, moving grains of sand along on the beach, trying to uh, make a case for the kinds of concerns uh, that exist. But certainly we're starting to see these conversations more in the mainstream. All right. Now, 2018 was an interesting year. Um, fi the Financial Times declared that their word of the year was tech lash. And I find it interesting that um, some people are arguing right now during this uh, time of a global pandemic of the coronavirus and COVID-19 that technology has once again saved us. There's no doubt it is incredibly convenient for us to be able to have this kind of um, connectivity vis-a-vis -vis network technologies or the internet or having our laptops and our phones and those of us who, who have access to that, which quite frankly is not the majority of the world. Um, but for those who are privileged to have these kinds of connections, um, many people think that uh, you know, technology is saving us. It's keeping us connected um, now more than ever. And I'll leave it to the social psychologist to talk uh, 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 in their own words about um, whether indeed we are being saved by these technologies. But I think that it's interesting to see us enter uh, a moment of introspection, let's say 2018 being a year that kicked off more introspection about um, uh, the promises and the failed promises of technology and whether indeed those are, um, uh, whether those can be fulfilled on. And so this is indeed, I think, still a moment of tech clash. Now, um, let me share some examples for you from the book of, of clear-cut examples of how race gets encoded into systems. Now, a reminder, all right, so um, the book cover really kind of tells it all, algorithms of oppression. So you kind of have a sense of what I'm talking about here. Um, Certainly, I was, uh, as I was capturing many, many, many cases of what I thought of as algorithmic discrimination or um, places where race and gender, both working together and separately, were um, um, deeply uh, embedded into the kinds of logics that we find in large-scale commercial search engines. Um, part of the reason that I study commercial search engines uh, is because I'm interested in 
the way in which the public relates to search engines like a kind of a public comments. You know, um, as I was leaving the advertising industry, I spent 15 years in marketing and, and advertising in a variety of different positions working for large brands and in agencies that worked uh, uh, on campaigns for large brands. You know, we were very clear with the advent of search engines that they were indeed advertising platforms. And so it was interesting when I went back to graduate school, in some ways, I think to, let's say, atone for my sins in advertising, I was thinking about how um, people in academia, many people in academia were talking about search engines like the new public library, like the new knowledge commons. Um, at the time that I entered graduate school in 2009, there was kind of the, uh, Academic libraries were in the throes of the Google Book Digitization Project, for example, and there was a lot of um, uh, envy over those who could work with the company and do research with the company and think about the company as this kind of new liberatory portal um, or way of organizing knowledge and information into um, broader view for a variety of publics. And as I was thinking about that, uh, in fact, I was studying with um, uh, Dr. Nakamura, um, thinking about the ways in which search um, kind of portended, you know, this, this reality of truthfulness or of credibility or of um, legit legitimating web results through its ranking process. But um, what many people couldn't see under the hood was the way in which uh, industries were optimizing content. Companies were paying top dollar, for example, um, to uh, make certain types of content more visible than others. So um, I wanted to share with you some examples of how that kind of looks when um, racist ideologies or sexism gets kind of encoded into the projects and becomes difficult to dislodge. So here's the first example. The Washington Post had a story that went um, viral and this was DeRay McKesson who, uh, you know, is a public figure on Twitter. <coughs> Excuse me. And he tweeted out, um, if you, um, uh, if you Google um, the N-word um, uh, house, this is what you'll find, America. And what was happening was this was during the administration of Barack Obama. President Obama, the first African-American president in the history of the United States, was in office. And what was happening is that um, uh, Google Maps was being optimized in a way that was having searches on the N-word. Uh, I, I don't use the N-word, um, certainly not in this environment, um, but I'll just let, leave you to understand the kind of um, horrible um, racist slur that is used against African-Americans or Black people in the United States, when it, particularly when it's used by non-African-Americans. Um, the inward house and the inward king when you did searches on those in google maps google maps would take you to the white house so here's an example of the way in which um, google responded which was basically to kind of issue an a, a non-apology apology um you know that their teams are working to fix this issue quickly and um we're sorry if there if anyone was offended um as if you know, people would not be offended, um, or maybe a handful of people. So many people were indeed offended. And, um, you know, the way in which this gets framed, I think is really um, also interesting, as if this is a uh, momentary glitch. And of course, this is one of the things that um, uh, critical technology scholars are often um, pointing to a variety of different ways in which um, tech companies respond to failures in their systems by making them technical failures, naming them as technical failures and not as failures of the underpinning logics that would allow for uh, this kind of um, error to happen. Let's look at another example. Here we have a video that went viral 
on Twitter. This was Kabir Ali, who was a teenager from the East Coast of the United States who uh, had his friends uh, videoing him on the phone while he looked up three words in Google image search. And he looks up the words, three black teenagers. And what you see are a variety of kind of criminalized images of African Americans or black Americans um, that show up in Google image search, really kind of um, presented as if these are just facts. These are, these are the images, the truth of what black teenagerdom looks like in America. Um, then he has his friend keep videoing and he says, now let's see what happens when we change one word. Let's change the word black to white. And what you see here are these kind of perfectly curated Getty stock photo kinds of images of white teenagerdom. Um, I always find it fascinating because the white kids are holding like balls from every sport, um, really uh, well orchestrated here. And, um, you know, this is a, a tweet that went viral, right? And since then, we've had so many more. I mean, um, in fact, one of the things I found quite fascinating, this was one of the cases uh, in the book. There's just so many dozens and dozens of examples. Um, I, I always felt that um, uh, cert, big search companies, Google and otherwise, kind of took it like a big book of tickets. You know, they just were like, oh, let's work on that. Let's fix oh, Let's fix that. Such that um, uh, they did indeed fix three black teenagers and suppress these kinds of um, uh, images. In fact, the next day, um, uh, someone on Twitter noticed that Google had added this image of a, a young white man um, who was being sentenced. In fact, this is a, a, an image of a man who had been convicted. He was being sentenced here um, for a vicious, brutal hate crime against an African-American man. So we have this kind of, uh, this is where I so appreciate um, media studies and having uh, it, training in media, media studies, because what, if we read this closely, what this is telling us is that Google is in fact legitimating the criminality, the criminalized imagery of African Americans by saying, oh, well, in this one case, we have one example of a white teenager being a criminal too. Now, again, r reminding us that crime or criminal or, or or arrests, none of these words are tied to the representation of three black um, teenagers or three white teenagers, but there's a, a particular kind of logic at play, a, a racist logic, in fact, that is legitimizing the African-American criminality by putting one image of an African-American teen who's being arrested. And I find this incredibly fascinating um, also because um, it's such an extreme uh, idea or vision about um, what white criminality might look like for teenagers, right? So I think this is um, something uh, worth noting. This is, again, one of the ways in which I would um, characterize how racial ideologies about who people are get encoded at the level of legitimation in a large scale um, technical platform like this. Now you'll see that in the images of African Americans, we've kind of added in a couple of friendly uh, images of African Americans. I don't know if it's like you know girls playing volleyball and maybe a church youth group or something, but the predominant image still is of kind of a criminalized mugshot oriented uh, representation of African American teenagers. And okay, so this is um, for me such a uh, these are powerful examples of the normalization of racist ideas about black people and the um, attempts by tech companies to solve the bias by um, uh, effectively trying to neutralize the, the complaint about the racist imagery by then kind of putting in um, a, a white person who 
is being sentenced. So I think we want to think through again, like looking at these things and doing these kinds of close readings are very valuable because what they do is they help us understand the um, both the mindset of um, how tech platforms get designed and um, also how the limits of imagination about intervening or fixing um, some of these problems. All right. Now, this next slide is uh, really from directly from the early work that I did in 2011. And um, this is where I was looking and kind of systematically tracking the uh, representations of girls of color in search. And, <coughs> excuse me, in this case, here's an image, uh, a screenshot of a search on the keywords black girls. This is from 2011. Now, I started looking at this in 2009. By 2011, I kind of had locked in on that this was a pattern and started trying to write more in a more detailed way about what was happening. So here you have uh, in 2011, and in fact, this was the case up until the fall of 2012. Um, when you did a keyword search on black girls, Asian girls, Latina girls, um, the first page of search results was almost entirely pornography. So there's some interesting things happening here. First, you have the first hit is a porn site. And then that's followed by a UK band of white guys who call themselves the Black Girls. Now this Ars Electronica crowd, maybe you've heard of the Black Girls. Um, everywhere that I've ever gone and given a talk in a decade about the Black Girls, the band of white guys showing up second as the representation for Black Girls, um, I ask all the time, has anyone ever heard of the Black Girls? I think five people in 10 years have actually heard of the Black Girls. So maybe you have heard, because I know this is a very avant-garde, artistic, and savvy um, audience who's watching this, but I find it incredibly interesting that they had the um, ability to break through all of the content that might be on the web that is relevant to black girls, that has been optimized with the words black girls, that is meaningful to black girls, um, to be ranked number two. Um, so this was very, quite fascinating. And then what follows are a number of highly sexualized um, or pornographic websites. Um, again, pointing to that when I was collecting these searches, these, I was not using the word porn. I was not using the word sex. I was just using the identities of girls of color and that was synonymous with pornography. And of course, this to me was the um, wake up call about the way in which racist and sexist ideologies come together and they um, create um, new realities or new kinds of truth um, in these platforms. And of course, if you, if you put that in context, with the way that people use these systems. You know, um, a lot of attention has been paid to uh, social media, particularly post-2016 presidential election in the United States, when um, the kind of logics that I argue in my book were at play when, um, when we were searching for people of color, women, girls of color, and you find all kinds of really um, profoundly upsetting and disturbing results. And of course, these have to do with the, not just the logics that are at play, but of course, the things that don't get tested for in a, a uh, R&D environment or user experience environment in these large companies, the oversight that comes um, and lack of um, oversight that comes from not having a diverse workforce so that different provocations and different questions don't happen in those environments because there aren't people who are who embody these uh, these identities that would be um, asking questions that might be relevant. So this is, of course, incredibly important. I wrote about this um, in the spring of 2012. Uh, I wrote a, an article about this. I was just wrapping up my graduate studies and it came out in Bitch Magazine, which is a feminist um, pop, uh, pop culture kind of magazine, a critique of pop culture magazine. And um, the very same logics that I try to explain in the book, which is how both capital, so 
industries and companies that have a tremendous amount of money that can really pay to optimize keywords. So the role of capital is so incredibly important in the kinds of results that we get. Coupled with um, deep kinds of uh, technical knowledge and technical training. And of course, one of the places where we also see this, not just in kind of racially and gendered uh, uh, discriminatory um, search results, uh, uh, we also see this, for example, in the amazing book that um, Professor Jan Jesse Daniels wrote called Cyber Racism, where she shows how, for example, white nationalists and white supremacists have a high degree of technical skill, and they are able to optimize and really use um, uh, the kind of technical prowess in those communities to make racist content more visible. Uh, and of course, these things are very fascinating and important, and I think still hold true. If you look at the more recent research from people like Joan Donovan, uh, my colleague at Harvard at the Shorenstein Center, who studies um, media manipulation and disinformation and tracks white supremacists, white nationalists, neo-Nazis, those are not interchangeable and synonymous, by the way. Um, those communities are incredibly well organized and technically savvy and use that savvy and the power of their networks to make certain types of content more visible, uh, both in social media, in YouTube, in search and other places. And so I think this is really also quite fascinating and important um, to understand how these logics work. Now, part of the challenge here is that these tropes that we see about women and girls of color, about um, race and gender uh, are old tropes, right? So um, many people, I think, um, understand uh, racist and gendered stereotypes, particularly about black people and indigenous people around the world. Um, Orientalism, kind of all of the racist um, ideologies that are used to keep women of color in particular in our place, in our alleged place, that uh, of, of disempowerment, of um, lower status, lower wages in positions where we are, our lives are controlled and let's say overdetermined by majority populations, by um, people with power. And so um, one of the kind of old media tropes that is quite powerful and potent in the um, making of these narratives about the hypersexualization of black girls, it's kind of this old Jezebel trope. Um, you know, I have a, a slide here that shows kind of a, a long history of these hypersexualized images going back two centuries in the United States or more that really mischaracterize and misrepresent black women and girls as hypersexualized. And um, we understand to some degree what that means when we see those images in um, mainstream media like Hollywood movies or television shows. Um, we uh, understand these tropes as tropes of control. We, you know, uh, what uh, Patricia Hill call, Collins calls controlling images. So these controlling images are really to, you know, the angry black woman, the gold digger, the hypersexualized um, black woman, um, the mammy, right? All of these different kinds of controlling images are so powerful and again, kind of over determining what's possible for black women because they, um, they operate as kind of a common sense lo uh, racist logic in societies. Certainly we see this in the United States and in other places around the world. And they become embedded so deeply in popular culture and in um, uh, kind of the everyday common sense of a society that um, to see them replicated and um, optimized in something like a search engine uh, is it should be the kind of logic we would expect or the plausible next step that would happen in these kinds of platforms. Um, I can tell you that um, one place you can look if you want to learn more about this is an incredible new film called Invisible Portraits 
by uh, debut filmmaker Ogi Ibuono, who, um, whose film is on Vimeo, and I think it will be distributed more widely soon. And you can um, understand the way in which these controlling images have had such a profound impact in um, Black women's lives and in uh, with the, the lives of women of color, but also the ways in which resistance to these controlling images is always um, uh, palpable because we understand that these assertions about us are not only patently false, but they are used to silence and diminish our voices. One of the things that I found so powerful about um, these kinds of controlling images in search is that they again get served up as natural, as, as uh, uh, inevitable. Again, even without adding the words porn or sex, black girls just become synonymous with these controlling images of hypersexuality and um, of a Jezebel stereotype. And I think that um, what this has done is it's opened up whole new conversations and lines of inquiry by not just, you know, my former students, but other people's um, students by artists and activists and people who are thinking um, much more critically um, about um, uh, how we speak back to these images and what do we do when, you know, unlike Hollywood where these images might be uh, pervasive, we understand Hollywood or we understand uh, media making to be kind of unidirectional from makers, from producers, from directors, from studios, um, and served out to publics. But people's orientation towards something like search is that they think that it is highly democratic. Many, many people still to this day try to argue with me that search is purely a reflection of what people are searching for, that there's no relationship between um, profitability and optimization of content. And of course, we know that this is patently false. We know that the entire logic of commercial search is, is um, advertising. And if you look at the kind of um, ad uh, planning, keyword planning tools, um, I was thrilled to see the markup and um, my uh, colleagues, uh, you know, Julia Angwin and her team of investigative journalists at the, uh, at the markup do a replication, in fact, of this study uh, around Black girls. And one of the things they found is that these keywords are still incredibly profitable uh, within uh, the keyword planning tool. Um, and this was just a study they replicated about three, three weeks ago. Uh, so uh, in, in late July. So I invite you to look at these ways in which um, women and people of color and especially women of color are really profoundly um, not in a position always to speak back to these. And of course, this means to me that this is an opening for thinking about advocacy, regulation, and um, uh, consumer harm that happens and harm to the public that happens in these spaces and in these platforms. Because, you know, even if all of the girls of color, all of the black girls, all the Latina girls and Asian girls um, broke up in all the piggy banks and tried to optimize their content beyond what the porn industry has been able to do to their images, we would not have enough money. We would not have enough resource to, uh, to fight on the plane of, of uh, capital and um, out purchasing um, those uh, who are um, interested in these kind of nefarious uh, representations. Um, we also don't have the, the numbers. So when you think of uh, search as being a, a hyper democratic space, I would just remind you that if you are in the numerical minority uh, in any country, if you are religious or ethnic or gender minority, you will not have the, uh, the weight of uh, democracy and the majority rules to help you um, find fair representation. And I think this again is something so incredibly important. We see through a variety of different platforms uh, how these technologies get used and weaponized against vulnerable people. And these 
these not only play into broader kind of um, cultural racist and gendered logics, sexist logics, but they um, capitalize on the fact that um, uh, these logics are already doing so much work in the society in a variety of other spaces in employment in education we see discrimination we see wage disparity we see lack of access to a whole host of opportunities in um, societies where um, ethnic and religious minorities are not in, do not have power uh, in, a, in any substantial uh, collective way and so this is why it's incredibly important to think about um, the degree to which these large-scale digital platforms instantiate and reinforce this kind of disparity in our society. And yet they present themselves as value free, as neutral, as not invested, even though you can see from the latest replication of my study, um, racist and sexist ideas are incredibly profitable and associating black girls with pornography and hypersexualized content is still incredibly profitable for Google. All right, so, you know, for years I talked about this and when I talk about it in the context of kind of racial and gender discrimination for um, women and girls of color, people have said, oh, that's just so sad, you know, that's terrible. Um, maybe, uh, maybe they've said that. Um, sometimes there has not been any sympathy or empathy toward, um, uh, toward the people that I uh, care so deeply about in my research. Um, but then there was a study that came along in 2014 where um, two social scientists, Epstein and Robertson, did a study on the way in which political candidates were represented in search. One of the things they found is that in very tight races, if negative stories showed up on the first page of search about a political candidate, then people were people reported they would not vote for that candidate. And if positive stories showed up on the first page, people would argue that they were voting for that person. And they used search engine results to help legitimate or inform their opinion. And one of the things that they found is that in very tight races, those who spend the most money, political action committees, in fact, to smear the opposition and bolster their own uh, uh, reputations, were able to really influence um, election results. Now, um, we can see from the kind of election interference that has happened in many democracies around the world, uh, modern democracies, not just in the United States, we can see these logics at play. Um, <clears throat> I think they were certainly at play in the uh, campaign uh, that Hillary Clinton ran and the way in which this information or misrepresentative information or patently false lies circulated about her and uh, uh, during her campaign. And so um, we must pay attention to the way in which platforms and, uh, are, are working to influence um, and the way in which um, fact versus fiction is often flattened into this very simple wor word, content. And I find it um, incredibly um, uh, damaging. And uh, many uh, uh, new books and studies are coming out really helping us understand and nuance this word content because content might mean an evidence-based study. It might be a, a longitudinal study. It might be 100 years of climate science put right next to, uh, alongside racist propaganda, disinformation, patently false lies, all of its content. And so we want to be thinking very, very seriously about this word content and the way in which um, another flattening word, data, get used um, in harmful ways. So here, while we have the study by Epstein and Robertson where they argue that in fact, in fact um, democracy is at stake because of the way in which large-scale big tech uh, platforms operate, um, 
we see this now showing up in very mainstream ways. Just last week, we had uh, saw the story in the UK of predictive analytics being used to determine who gets to go to college. And one of the things that we discovered um, by our friends, uh, our investigative journalist friends at The Guardian, was that <coughs> predictive analytics and data was collected and used to make assessments about students in the UK and predicted um, that private school students, uh, you know, 39% more likely to be admitted into um, colleges. And this is incredibly profound when you're talking about four out of 10 students, um, uh, you know, whose fate uh, and opportunity to go to college hangs in the balance. Uh, very, very significant kind of finding. And I think these are the kinds of things that we want to care about when we talk about things like data. Now, um, uh, for those of you who are more technical, um, who work around um, data science, machine learning, uh, and um, uh, kind of narrow AI projects of this nature, um, one of the things that I will say is that, you know, we often try to uh, think about data as a social construct in, in my field, in information, library and information science or information studies. We really understand coming out of a field that is 100% for the most part predicated upon classification, cataloging knowledge, cataloging books, um, making sense of uh, uh, keywords to represent different kinds of knowledge. <coughs> Excuse me. We understand that work to be um, uh, imbued with politics and power and decision making and it's incredibly important work and so um, uh, it's important for us to um, think about the frameworks within which um, things like data are um, are also being flattened into just uh, you know numbers or data sets or statistics that that one inherits and then does not feel any sense of accountability for what that data may represent now, in um, uh, many tech companies disavow their responsibility for uh, the content that moves through their platforms. They actually would characterize it as content or data, and they take an agnostic position toward it. We certainly see in places like Germany and France that um, more content is being um, uh, regulated, hate speech, anti-Semitism, and so forth. And so while in many countries, big tech companies argue that they um, are not responsible. Uh, they are responsible indeed in the countries where they do business where uh, trafficking and hate speech, for example, is against the law. And so I think that this is an interesting juxtaposition that we are in. Now, um, when big tech companies have been asked about racism, uh, in their platforms and racist content, one of the things that they say is that to interfere with racist content moving through their platforms would be bad technology practice. And this, of course, is the case in the um, that was picked up by the media a couple of years ago uh, in the uh, uh, way in which white nationalists had, for example, co-opted the term Boasian anthropology. And um, oftentimes you'll see this kind of optimizing of what you might think of as fairly um, obscure kinds of keywords or phrases, but really there's a kind of a coordinated effort around fields of study, different kinds of disciplinary domains to control narratives and to control them in white supremacist, anti-Semitic, um, sexist um, ways. And this is, of course, a place that we need a tremendous amount of attention. Um, uh, I won't say much more about uh, uh, this except to say that um, you know, in the days following the U.S. presidential election in 2016, when Donald Trump was elected, the very first hit when you did a search on final election results took you to a disinformation site that reported that um, Donald Trump had won the popular vote. Now, we understand that he won the Electoral College, but he did not win the popular vote. In fact, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by 3 million votes. And so the way in which um, fact gets legitimated or delegitimized in um, something like a commercial search engine, again, is so incredibly important because people really are operating, they're counting on these systems to 
um, present them with some level of uh, vetting or some level, level of, of credible uh, information. And I think these are the kinds of things we want to be paying very, very close attention to and um, pressing for regulation. If these are going to be related to you as a public good, then they have to be uh, work in that way. Maybe more importantly, um, I'm running out of time, maybe more importantly, these companies need to um, <clears throat> both be evaluated in terms of their um, threats to democracy and um, public harm, but maybe we also need alternatives that are not just simply commercial advertising projects and, and platforms. You know, one of the things I say as I come to a close here is that social inequality will not be solved by an app. We have such um, an emphasis now on <clears throat> uh, solving social problems through technology. And, you know, I think that this is one of the places where we uh, really are um, in trouble, that more and more investment is going into um, uh, technology solutions that in, in some cases are, are snake oil uh, uh, products. You know, it's a snake oil salesman um, convincing us that there is an app that will solve our problems rather than thinking about the broader um, uh, racial, economic, and gendered injustices in our society. And I think these are so incredibly important for us to not um, create new market opportunities that exploit um, oppression and create a new side of profit to deploy some type of technical solution. You know, we don't see technical solutions being used or AI being used in the rapid redistribution of resources, for example, in a society that would solve things like um, economic inequality or racial inequality or gender disparity in pay and otherwise. So I think these are things we want to be thinking about and what uh, uh, for whom do these technologies work? And, um, you know, uh, if you're interested in reading more about that, there's an excerpt from uh, the book at Wired um, uh, magazine uh, has. So um, I'll leave you with some um, key opportunities for the future. I mean, a couple of things that I just want to hit, you can read these and look at these uh, uh, at your leisure, but I'll say, you know, I think that it's the voices of the most disaffected. It's people who identify with and are in solidarity with people who are experiencing harm in our societies, who have such important voices that need to come to the fore. I can tell you that, <coughs> I can tell you that in my own work, um, I do feel like it was a bit of, of pushing a boulder up a mountain to have uh, the ideas that I had um, accepted. In fact, there were so many more people who did not accept or who rejected uh, the ideas that I was arguing about. Um, you know, part of that was my own embodied experience. I was the only black woman in my PhD program at the time uh, that I was there. I was um, not a computer scientist. There were many people who uh, argued that uh, what I was seeing was not true or not real, even though we had the evidence and or that I had to keep providing evidence that there there's just like a threshold or a mountain of evidence threshold that women of color and black people in particular are always required to uh, find uh, and produce and make in order to be understood or to be seen. Um, and even when we provide that, it doesn't um, necessarily um, have the kind of import um, that it should. And so I want to just really encourage those of you who are makers, who are artists, who are students, people who are um, feeling like the things you see and the things that you are attuned to, um, that those are not being duly recognized, that you, that you pursue and persist because I think some of the most important voices, you know, it has truly been women of color, scholars and journalists and LGBTQ scholars and journalists who have pushed these conversations about the racial and gendered implications of technology into the mainstream. Now, many, many of us are also being written out of our story at some of the same kind of uh, techno-utopian corridors and, and sites of, uh, of power and influence are now in charge of ethics, but that's a different talk for a different time. I'll just say that I think that 
um, listening to the voices of people who um, who are uh, artists and makers and dreamers and thinkers um, in, in different ways really needs to be brought to the center of many of our conversations. And we should be watching. There will be many more technology boards and oversight commissions and, and so forth. Um, and we need the knowledge from gender and women's studies, from ethnic studies, from black studies, indigenous studies, American Indian studies, uh, Chicano Latino studies, from uh, the knowledge from LGBTQ um, theorists um, theorizing around the binary and um, what non-binary technologies and possibilities and ways of thinking um, might afford us. In fact, we might find that many of the technologies that are coming at us so rapidly um, uh, should be illegal, should not exist, should be um, eradicated from our societies. And I think that we're, there's a lot of interesting work that is on the horizon and we're just at the beginning of imagining um, different kinds of possibilities and certainly around resisting some of the kinds of things um, that we see. You know, um, we do have more technology uh, uh, and data than ever, and we have more inequality to go with it. We have uh, people, millions of people around the world pouring out into the streets, standing in solidarity for calls for justice for Breonna Taylor, for George Floyd, for the victims of um, police brutality, for African Americans, Black people, and Indigenous people around the United States who have been um, unjustly and um, uh, uh, profoundly and systemically targeted um, again and again, whether it's by the police or whether it's by technologies of surveillance and policing. And I think that there's a, an opening now for the work that um, Black women in particular have done in leading our um, calls for racial and economic justice around the world, there's really an opening um, that we can take to think about how research and knowledge and art uh, can intervene and make for a more just world. And certainly I think of my work, <clears throat> I want it so much to be in service of these conversations. Um, you know, just as no, uh, no research and no data, no content is flat and neutral, um, our work is not neutral either. And I think that rather than looking to perfect the technology, we want to think about the ways um, in which we might have other kinds of more just relationships rather than investing all of our resources in an app that's supposed to save us. Why not think about the broken systems that in fact come at the expense of the appification and gamification of so many of our um, long-standing social problems. So with that, I want to say thank you so much to Ars Electronica, to, um, to the whole team that invited, and I know there's just so many people involved in the um, development of such an amazing conference, and I want to wish you a great uh, and successful um, journey in your own work, and I hope that we'll cross paths again uh, with the uh, your work and ours at the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, and I uh, wish you a great day. For details of our program, please check our website. We are very much looking forward to having you as a part of a high-tech, anti-discrimination activist collective.